All right, let's, uh, let's pray. Father, we thank you now for this time to dive into your word. Lord, may you give us a focus. May you give us a clarity that can only come from you, Lord. I pray that you just help our minds to focus and to be free from distraction. And Lord, we're just thankful for your word that is alive and your spirit teaches us. So uh, be in this space now, Father, for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're looking forward to getting back into Ephesians today. Last week, again, for Reformation Day, we kind of took a pause on that. But uh, we've spent quite a bit of time already in Ephesians chapter 1, a week after week after week, looking at that really long sentence in chapter 1, verses 3 through 14. And there's a kind of a, a little bit of a reminder of it for you, of all these amazing blessings that we possess in Christ, right? Chose us before the foundation of the world, predestined us for adoption, redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, obtained an inheritance, sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. And all these are like in Christ. It's 100% gospel. It is all good. And then Paul closes the chapter one off with this amazing prayer that is the direct context then of chapter two, which we're going to get into today. Remember, letters back then, you don't have the chapter verse divisions like we have today. So this prayer goes right into our text today. And it's a really significant context. Note that key word there. Paul is praying that you would know, that you would know something, right? We talked about this two weeks ago. Know what? The immeasurable greatness of his power toward us according to his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead, right? So Paul is saying, we want you to know about the power of God that is manifested in the resurrection of Christ, okay? Which is also then at work in your life. So Paul is praying for the saints here that they would know the power of God, a power so strong that it actually raised somebody from the dead, namely Christ. And Paul is saying that we would know that same power too because that same power is at work in us to do the very same thing, which he is now then going to demonstrate. Now, why would we need to know this kind of power that leads to salvation? Why would we need to see the immense power of God at work in our life to save us? Well, the reason being (laughs) is that we people massively, massively underestimate the power needed by God to make a sinner a saint. Okay? And, and, and we have massively underestimated God's power because we've massively underestimated the problem, which is us. And so when we hear about Jesus, and we hear, yeah, Jesus loves us and God loves us, we're like, well, well yeah, why wouldn't he? I mean, we're pretty awesome. We love ourselves, so why wouldn't God love us? We hear about God's love and we think, oh, that's so nice. And, but maybe we, we don't think it's such a big deal because we think we're pretty awesome people. And so by us underestimating the problem, we therefore then have kind of a skewed understanding of the power of God necessary to change us. Well, come on, Pastor. Aren't you being a little dramatic here? We all know this. We, we know we're sinners. It's those people out there. They don't know that. Here's the deal. Paul's writing to the church. He's writing to non, he isn't writing to non-Christians in chapter 2 here. He's writing to the church. He's writing to Christians. You see, unfortunately, we kind of have an aversion to really wanting to grasp the problem in our lives, which is sin. We would rather pretend that we're just fine. And so what Paul is going to do here, going into chapter 2, is that he is going to make a deliberate choice inspired by the Spirit of God to further help these Ephesian Christians know the immense power of God that was needed for our salvation because knowing that power, knowing this issue is going to transform our lives and transform our walk with Christ, okay? That's kind of the context. All right, a little bit more literary context here. And I want to do this. I was trying to debate if I wanted to do it or not, but it's kind of a nerdy thing to do, but I'm going to do it anyway uh, and hopefully not bore you to death. Ephesians 2 verse 10, that's what you see right there, right? It's a very well-known passage. Many of you have memorized this. There are three long sentences, actually three long sentences, verses 1 to 7, verses 8 and 9, and verse 10. And Paul is using a certain literary context here. He doesn't just throw it together like we write sentences today. It is a brilliant masterpiece of literature. It's called a chiasm, all right, which is basically an intentional, sophisticated framing or balancing of content. And each marker then is related to its opposite counterpart. And each section then is spiraling toward the thematic center. That is what is happening in chapter 2. And you can see this all played out there. And so what's cool about this is that 
It is a step-by-step description of man's problem and then a step-by-step undoing of that problem by the resurrection power of Christ in our life with the center highlighted by grace you have been saved. Pretty cool. So Paul's heart here is obviously that we would know the power of God at work in us, that in him there is a resurrection. All right, enough of this Bible nerd kind of stuff. Uh, We're going to look at the text. All right, here we have chapter 2, verse 1 to 7. And you were dead in trespasses and sins, which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all... We once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us, In Christ Jesus. Again, two verses, one through seven. Our journey today, we're going to look at two parts. The walking dead and the mercifully resurrected. Now, just a little heads up here. This text is familiar. Like I said, many of you have memorized chunks of this passage. The content of this text is familiar. Don't let it be, though. Don't let it be. Don't allow your mind and your heart to start wandering when we get into this. Oh, I know all this stuff. Pastor, don't let that happen. Trust me, there's gold here that is deeply meaningful and relevant. All right, let's dive into this. The walking dead. Verse 1, And you were dead in trespasses and sins which you once walked. Dead in trespasses and sins. That doesn't sound awesome, (laughs) okay? Like It kind of goes against the grain a little bit, doesn't it? We don't want to deal with this. We don't want to hear this kind of language. We would rather avoid it. We would rather redefine it. We would, we would rather say, wait a minute, no, no, that's not true. How many of you have seen uh, Monty Python's Search for the Holy Grail? There is a clip that I would love to show you, but I just feel like it's a little bit edgy for our young people here. There's a scene in there that illustrates this so well, the human condition. It's the bring out your dead scene, if that's like maybe you're thinking about it. And it's during the plague, many are dying, and there's a man, again, pushing a cart of corpses through the town, and he's ringing a bell saying, bring out your dead, bring out your dead. And so then you have a customer approaches the cart with this older man over his shoulder to place on the pile, right? And the old man all of a sudden says, I'm not dead, right? And the guy's like, yes, you are. He's like, no, I'm not. And there's this banter back and forth. And he, he, the guy's like, I'm getting better. And then the customer says, no, stop being a baby, And he says, I think I'll go for a walk. I'm happy. But eventually they club him on the head and they throw him on the cart. Okay? Those of you that know the scene, you can imagine that. Those of you that don't, go watch it. The old man's words here, though, reflect our own protest against this text. Okay? And you were dead in your trespasses and says, no, I'm not. I'm not dead. I'm just fine. In fact, I'm getting better. Paul's not making a joke. He's telling us the truth. You know, as I was studying this this last week, I I guess I shouldn't be surprised, but just how many try to redefine this passage. No, Paul's not actually saying what he writes here. He's not actually meaning dead, but just maybe diseased or maybe weakened or or maybe struggling. Uh, You know, it's just Paul. He's kind of being dramatic. Uh, It's just a metaphor for something. It's not that really that big of a deal. And I'm just thinking, like, let the text stand. Let's just read the text in context. Remember, all of the gospel identity aspects of chapter 1 that we spent so much time in. It all aligns perfectly with this description of man before new birth. Adoption, redeemed, forgiven. Not to mention the whole resurrection theme in the passage. You kind of have to be dead to be resurrected. It's kind of a prereq, right? It's just the way it is. The text simply says, you were dead. Remember, he's talking to Christians. So if you are in Christ now, what he is saying is that This is what you were pre-Christ. If you are not in Christ now, if you are not trusting in Christ, this is what you are presently. Plain and simple, all right? Dead in your trespasses and sins. So what does that mean? Well, honestly, it's not that complicated. You were dead, right? And he's talking about spiritual death here. 
And in fact, he writes this in the present tense. And, and so the natural man, right, outside of Christ is, is in this ongoing condition of deadness. You're just continually dead, spiritually dead. Now, this isn't talking about physical life, right? We, we are very much physically alive, and we make decisions, and we live, and we do our lives. And yet we are spiritually dead without Christ. And this, that kind of death is so much more profound and damaging. Dead in sin literally means that you are a spiritual zombie. You are a dead man walking. You are completely unable, spiritually speaking, to make a move toward God. It means that you do not have the ability to do God-honoring and God-pleasing righteous works. It means that you are in great danger because you are spiritually dead. And by definition, you are separated from a living God. As Paul says in chapter 4, we'll get there in a while, you're alienated from the life of God. And the cause of that is right there, trespasses and sins. Trespasses has that idea of rebellious or treacherous actions. A sin has that idea of lawlessness, missing the mark on God's objective code. And each of those words have a nuance, but really we're talking about the deep reality of sin here. We hit this a few weeks ago. Sin is any thought, word, or action that breaks the law of God, and that includes our attitudes and our motivations, everything. What that means, friends, is that all sins are against God. Yes, we might affect other people, but we remain guilty before God. When we talk about sin, we aren't just simply talking about the actual doing of sin, our actions. That's really superficial. We have to talk about what's inside, right? Our sinful nature. And that's what Scripture is painting such a bleak picture about, what we see here. And Scripture speaks of this inner corruption, our flesh, the old Adam, the old self, depravity. Romans 3, there's none who understands. There's none who seeks for God. All have turned aside Together they have become useless. There's no one who does good. There's not even one. 1 Corinthians, the natural man does not understand or accept the things of the Spirit of God. They're foolishness. And in fact, because of the sinful flesh, we actually pursue that which is sinful. We are disposed to that. We are not morally neutral. The intent of man's heart is evil from his youth, and the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit. You all know that, and so do I. And as a result of this, the wages of sin is death, and you are dead in your trespasses and sins. What a mess. What a mess. Offensive? Absolutely. <laughs> but let, just let the text stand. God is saying this. This isn't my idea. I don't like it at all, honestly. I don't think anybody in this room likes this. But God says this. And we have to understand this, friends, because what it does is that the more that we understand our deadness, spiritually speaking, the power of Christ is magnified ever more. We are the corpse on the table. And the only participation we have in our resurrection, by definition, is that we are objects of it. Okay? Dependent upon God. Now, Paul continues with a section that is, again, frankly, equally offensive, if not more so, because the fallout then of our sinful flesh and sinful desires is a sinful life. That sin is going to shape how we live our life. And there's a certain path that a natural man follows. It is a picture of enslavement with very active participatory words here, like following, like walking, like carrying out. And Paul presents then this enslavement with a classic trinity of ugliness, the world, the devil, and the flesh. And we are enslaved then to the world, Paul says, following the course of the world. And this isn't talking about the world and this beautiful creation and full of goodness kind of thing. That doesn't make sense. Rather, this is talking about the evilness of the world where other sinners are all together and we are naturally rebelling against God's desire. That makes the world a hard place to live in, doesn't it? Full of temptations, full of chaos, full of crazy, full of error, full of deception, full of hate. Convinced, hey, this is the best it's going to get. And a dead person in sin just goes about their business thinking that this is just normal. Knowing nothing else, there's an enslavement there. There's an enslavement then to the devil. Following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. The air there is a, to be understood as the realm of the spiritual forces as they're doing battle, right? And the prince of that air is working in sinners. It's the devil. He is the personal opponent of God's action and God's plan, of God's creation. He is the antichrist, right? He is constantly at work. In the, working through the sons of disobedience, sinners, working to destroy. And the natural man is completely unaware of it. Unaware of it. Unaware of his desire to destroy 
and kill and work unbelief. That's not good. (laughs) And there's another enslavement. The world, the devil, and then the flesh. Among whom all once we lived in the passions of the flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and of the mind, our sinful nature. Friends, we really don't need a lot of help from the world and the devil. We are are perfectly capable of ruining ourselves, (laughs) right? And the passions of our flesh that are controlled by a sinful lust, they're all controlled by this desire for self. And that's probably the most obvious reality that there is in this world. Being dead in sin, walking dead spiritually speaking, naturally creates a situation where we blindly follow, where we blindly walk and where we blindly crave and go after all those things. Right? Is that hard to hear? Yeah. But can you honestly think a better description of reality? The study of mankind reveals these things in spades. And the consequences? And you are by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. This is not, a, this is not saying that there's, there's a characteristic that we are wrathful children, although sometimes that happens. But rather, instead, is speaking about the hopelessness of our situation. He's describing the wrath of God upon the sinner here. And what is the wrath of God? The best definition that I've ever seen is that the wrath of God is the holiness of God in action. The holiness of God in action. It is God's natural response of being pure perfection and pure holiness against sin. And this is naturally then awakes those who are dead in their trespasses and sins, rebelling, rebelling, rebelling. Friends, this is the condition of natural man. And God chose to do something about it. Now again, I just want to make a comment here. He is talking to Christians saying, this is what you were, not this is what you are. And we need that clarity. And that needs to be said today. Friends, if you are in Christ today, you are not dead in your trespasses and sins. And you are not just blindly doing those things, following and being enslaved to all those types of things. However, however, those three enemies, the world, the devil, and the flesh, still wage war against you like no one's business, more than you realize. And yet, now we are not ignorant and foolish, just blindly going without, without being aware of it. We are not helpless. We have the Spirit of God in us, Right? And so the greater that we understand that and just how pervasive and just how pernicious they are, just how much they seek to destroy us, the greater then we can be alert to them and fight against them. And the greater that we can understand that, man, we need one another. We need one another. We need this thing called the church where we come and be fed and nourished to fight against all of that. All right, now remember what Paul's doing here. Let's get our bearings here. He has just prayed at the end of chapter 1 that the saints would know the power of God at work in believers and the same power that rose Christ from the dead. And now he's wanting them to see this same power that rose Christ from the dead was needed to raise you just because of your spiritual deadness. Because mankind doesn't need just a shot in the arm. (laughs) They need a miracle. They need a miracle. Well, I know what you're thinking. Wow, this has been a good time, Andy. Thank you. Real pep talk here. Power of positive thinking, right? Uh, Verses one through three. Well, this is the hinge point. This is the hinge point. Let's get into the second part here. The mercifully resurrected. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. What an amazing text, okay? Seriously. In fact, as you read it, and as we read it the whole thing the first time through in context, it it literally just jumps off the page. Man is ugly, 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 sinful, blindly following the world, following Satan, following the, the flesh, and they are subject of God's wrath because of all this sin. But... God, but God. And you see, God did something. (laughs) Even though we were dead in our trespasses, even though we were a total mess, spiritually speaking, even though we were slapping God in the face with all of our rebellion, but God. And what did he do? He made us alive together with Christ. Verse 5, that's the main verb here. 
he made us alive with Christ. And that's written in the past tense kind of way. It is a statement of fact. He's writing to believers. Friends in Christ, Ephesians Christians, this has happened. He has made you alive. It's a done deal. You were dead, now you are alive. And Christ's resurrection is your resurrection. And you have been raised with Christ and seated with him in the heavenly places. And the contrast here is so stunning. It is beautiful. But then Paul goes on here and gives one of the great pithy statements of all the scripture to paralyze, to parallel this sort of made aliveness. Look at that in verse 5. Even when we are dead in our trespasses and sins, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. By grace you have been saved. And I want to break this down because this is just stunning. And Paul goes out of his way, inspired by the Spirit of God, to write this in such a way that is so profound and so beautiful, and the extent of it is just flat out lost in our English translations. That phrase, have been saved, it's one word in the original, and Paul writes in the perfect tense, which means that this, whatever this is, is happened at a moment, right? It is a completed action, totally completed action with lasting results. And that is currently possessed by you, Ephesian Christian, right? You stand in this position of having been saved, completed action. Remember way back, I think maybe week two, where we had Marius and Ben up here with justification, sanctification, and we kind of uh, described those two things? That language of justification is all over here. It is a completed action. But there's more. Not only is it a perfect tense, right? It is also written in a passive voice, which is saying that this has happened to you. You were passive. Right? You, you, you have nothing to do with it. You're the dead person on, on, the, on, the, on the bed, right? You're the corpse. Which makes perfect sense. We are dead in our trespasses and sins. How much clearer could Paul make this? You were dead. You were passive. But God, and he has made you alive, and this is the miracle of the resurrection. He has caused this for you, to you, and this salvation is beautifully complete. It lacks absolutely nothing. Going back to chapter one, remember, you have been blessed within the heavenly places with every spiritual blessing. That means that we don't need anything more. Everything we have is now. And now we stand saved. And you simply can't improve that. Stunning. The text is just so good, friends. It's so good. It is so life-giving because it is all about Christ doing a miracle for you and for me. But note what it says about God. Because sometimes mankind wants to say, this isn't fair. We look upon God and we say, that, that, that can't happen. Why, why, why would God put us under wrath? And we play the victim card. All right? When we're the perpetrator, <laughs> the problem is us. Again, we misunderstand how deep it is. And, and God would have every right to just leave us in our rebellion, leave us in our hate, leave us with our fists pointed at God. But that's not who God is. Look in the text here. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love which he loved us, rich in mercy, and what is mercy? Mercy is not getting what you deserve. And we deserve nothing good from God. And yet we get everything good from him. It is, it is who he is. It is his heart. And this great love with which he loved us, this love, deep, sacrificial, unconditional love. And now we, as his creation, who he has formed, who he has deliberately made, who he know would fall into sin, that's us. We are his. And it's ugly. And yet... We are still his. We are his image bearers. Sometimes, this happens a lot within churches that are really more reformational based. Sometimes when we are trying to be so clear on the depth and the ugliness of our sin, we tend to forget that we're still image bearers of God. And we're still innately valuable and intrinsically valuable because we are crafted by our maker. Sometimes we can err so much on the spiritual death that we lose sight of the value of humanity right? 
The whole text here, while it does describe man's resurrection, it's all about God. It is all about God. It is all about his immense and completely almost irrational desire to save mankind, his unending mercy and his unending love that took him directly to the cross to do the only thing possible to save creation, to save his children of wrath. And the only thing that was possible would be then for him to endure the wrath that the children of wrath deserved at that cross. God's holiness in action slammed against Jesus, and he became a sin who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God. And all that pain and all that shame and all that sorrow and all that death was put on Christ so that we then could be made alive, forgiven. And now through faith, everything has been flipped. Everything has been flipped. And we are like Lazarus, right, who is dead, and Jesus walks up and says, Lazarus, come out. And life has been created in us. A resurrection has happened. In him, we are no longer the walking dead, blindly following after the world, the devil, and the flesh. Now we have been miraculously resurrected. We have been mercifully resurrected for him and his glory. And why is this so important for us to know, friends? Because it radically changes then how we see ourselves and how we see our lives in him. John Calvin said this. I love this quote. We never become properly conscious of how much we owe Christ until we have been reminded of how awful our condition was when we were still outside of him. Okay? Our lives, friends, everything, it's his. And because he is so good and because he is so merciful and because he is so loving and so kingly, right, and so beautiful, that's the best thing ever, to be his. And Paul wrote this to the Ephesian Christians saying, Friends, you got to know this immense power at work in your lives. That is a power that made you, that was dead, and now you are alive. And the more you know that resurrection power, the more you know what that is in, that is the same power at work in you through the Spirit of God. And we need to know that, friends. And we need to be encouraged by this. It is great, great news. But perhaps today, maybe this doesn't describe you. Maybe you're still the walking dead. You're here, and maybe you don't know Jesus. Maybe you're not trusting in him, and you're still just dead in your trespasses and sins. And you are just blindly following the world and blindly following the devil and blindly following the flesh. Hear this, guys. God can resurrect you. It's what he does. (laughs) He's good at it. The call for you, the invitation is to surrender and confess your sin and trust him, and he will make you alive. He will make you alive. And we can rejoice in this beautiful resurrection today. The same resurrection that all the church celebrates. The same resurrection that all the saints throughout time have have celebrated. And so let's take a few moments now, a private confession between you and the Lord, and then we'll pray together Psalm 51. Let's pray together. Psalm 51 is our prayer of confession. Have mercy on me, O God. According to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Father, thank you for the text today. Lord, not a pleasant text, at least the first half of it. And yet a text that we have to wrestle with. A text that magnifies the power of sin. A power that is still a reality that is still active in our lives, even in you. Or just the pernicious nature of sin. And yet, Father, we're so thankful for that incredible hinge point in the text. But, God, 
And Father, you didn't leave us in our sin. You didn't leave us in our death. Lord, that you in Christ have made us alive. By grace, we have been saved. And so that, Father, through faith, through trusting in you, that resurrection is ours. Lord, you have done this work in our lives, and we stand in that. And so, Father, as we confess our sins today, Lord, make us aware of them. Make us aware of our thoughts, words, and actions that are unpleasing to you, that, that hinder us in our walk with you. But, Father, bring us all the way back to the cross. Bring us back to this incredible proclamation that we have been saved by grace through faith and that there's forgiveness full and free in Christ. And, Father, for, if there are any here today that are still dead men walking, dead in trespasses and sins, Lord, break through and do a miracle. Work faith, Father, and be glorified. Thank you, Lord, for the grace that you give to us, your mercy that we so don't deserve but so need. May you just revive us in you today, strengthening our faith. Thank you, Father, that we now can receive the strengthening and the renewing of our faith as we partake in the table together. In Jesus' name, amen.